All right, 98 is about a very hot topic in trauma, which is the use of whole blood. Does anyone use whole blood in their trauma resuscitations? Okay, hand there. So this is something that trauma surgery is really interested in. You know, whole blood, obviously the idea of, of whole blood is, is lovely because you would really have to, you could stop having the conversation about component therapy if you were just transfusing whole blood. Um, you know, in the military, this is a, a great idea because you basically have a walking blood bank with all of your soldiers there and and so whole blood really came out of that idea. Component therapy, interestingly enough, is an idea that started, I don't know, back in like the 50s when blood donation, as they thought about blood donation, it would be a, a very good marketing tactic to tell you, you could donate one unit of blood and it could help up to five different people if we split it up into the red blood cells and the platelets and the plasma. And it is true that some people need one of those components versus another. So that makes sense. But in terms of trauma, as we talked about proper and the different types of ratios, should we be revisiting whether whole blood is the right way to go? Most of the data on whole blood to this point has been very military-based, which obviously is a certain type of population in a certain type of setting. And so this has been raised as another issue. So this paper, number 98, is um, from last year. It is a meta-analysis looking at a bunch of papers um, analyzing the use of whole blood. <clears throat> and so they pulled out... Um, several different studies, let's say 24 of them in this particular analysis. They're very heterogeneous studies, as I just mentioned. Some of these can be healthy people. Some of these are very severely injured people, but they looked at looking at uh, whole blood versus component therapy, using all the good methods, looking at mortality um, in the first 24 hours and then later down the line. And they found that survival was favored in the whole blood groups when they meta-analyzed -ana all these papers. Now, none of the papers in this meta-analysis are randomized controlled trials. There's no random controlled trial looking at this question at this point. It's all observational data. So the conclusion, the bottom line is here is that I don't think this paper answers the question. We need a randomized controlled trial to answer this question. There happens to be a randomized controlled trial going on right now, the TROOP trial, which is happening at many trauma centers, um, including where, where I work. So we will get a better answer to this question. Having talked to one of the authors on the TROOP trial, one of the challenges in studying this question is that often severely injured trauma patients, you come in, let's say you are in one of these trials places, they often have a very limited amount of whole blood to give you. So maybe you have five units of whole blood. Let's say you've transfused those five units of whole blood, and then you start moving on to component therapy because that's what you have. So often this will be a difficult question to answer because of the limited resource of whole blood and often having to move on to component therapy in this very sick trauma patient. So then are you really studying whole blood or are you kind of just studying a mix? That being said, we're, we're going to have better studies on this coming, coming soon. Um, and so why don't we have whole blood? And besides the whole donor component, whole blood doesn't last as long as on the shelf as component therapy, and it's expensive. So that's one of what, some of the barriers to having whole blood available. I, when this first came out, one of my best friends from medical school is a trauma critical care surgeon. He was actually stationed in uh, Iraq just mm -hmm. four months ago. And so I called him and I was like, hey, what are you doing? And his response was whole blood for the first 24 hours and then component therapy after that is where they're going. And he's managing a trauma center in Virginia Beach. And mm -hmm. so I think that's where it's likely going to come. Yeah. To your point, you can't just do whole blood yeah. for the whole time. Exactly. But um, that first 24 hours, maybe it suggests a little bit of an improved mortality benefit. I'll say there's also a trial happening in Los Angeles of whole blood in paramedic rigs, pre-hospital whole blood uh, as well. And so that's another, those are, that's more evidence that we'll see coming out in the future. Exciting stuff for next yeah. year's EMA course, maybe. It'll probably take a while. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it'll be years before we get that data, mm -hmm. you know, by the time they enroll the people and analyze and all that, probably won't be next year, but we'll get it. So this next one wants to, uh, uh, abstract number 99, does the timing of whole blood transfusion matter in trauma? So this was a large database review. It was done between 2019 and 2020. Um, and they took uh, voluntarily inputted data from a US and Canadian level one and two trauma centers. Uh, to be included in the study, you had to have received whole blood at some point in time in the first 24 hours uh, of that visit. And then they looked through to see if there was a change or difference in mortality if you were given the whole blood sooner versus given the whole blood later. And so they matched the, uh, for every point in time, uh, whether the person had received whole blood versus a person who hadn't received whole blood. And then they looked at the mortality and they found that there was an improvement in patient's mortality if they were given the whole blood earlier, both at the three day and the 30 day survival rate. Um, so if you're going to give whole blood to give it and start it sooner was better for the patient based on this. Uh, 
retrospective database review just looking at exact timing. Um, it, it was a civilian center, level one, level two is like we talked about. You had to have a, most of them systolic blood pressure is less than 90, a shock index, and they were involved in a massive transfusion protocol. Um, so it, it's... Um, it's interesting, uh, and I think it was done uh, in an interesting way too, but it, it does have a lot of limitations. Um, but if you are going to use whole blood and you are going to start the massive transfusion protocol, it's probably better to just start it earlier. Or where the patient's sicker and you're like, I need to start this sooner, and you started resuscitating them earlier, it's really hard to say whether it was the action of you just resuscitating them that ended up improving the patient or just simply getting the whole blood at an earlier time point. So hard to say for sure. Yeah. I think the randomized control trial is still needed. Yes. Um, one of the other uh, transfusion hot topics in trauma is whether or not um, we should be giving different ratios in different types of conditions. So the proper trial, which is the one that has led us, most of us, to be using a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio in terms of component therapy when we're doing massive transfusion, that study's 10 years old now. There have been some other studies that have come out asking these questions, looking at databases, are there subgroups that need different ratios? And so Paper 100 um, is a, a question looking at that high fresh frozen plasma to RBC ratio and survival outcomes. So maybe giving more FFP might be better in some patients. This is a Japanese group looking at three years of their trauma data bank. So it's a retrospective look, 2,000 patients, pretty severe blunt trauma patients. They took out everyone with severe head injuries. So these are non-head injured patients looking at outcomes, looking at their ratios of FFP to RBC. So a retrospective look, it's not controlled, but but some patients in their groups have gotten higher ratios of FFP to RBC. So they, they divided the patients up to, did you get the one-to-one -one of plasma to RBCs, or was your ratio higher in terms of how much plasma you got and what were the outcomes? And so they found that the higher FFP to RBC ratios seemed to be associated with lower mortality, suggesting that perhaps giving higher ratios of plasma in these patients was better. It was, it's thought-provoking. There seems to be an association there. Is that better? Um, the wrong mortality for one-to-one, -one, people who got one-to-one -one was 18%. And if you had a higher than one ratio of plasma what to, uh, to RBCs, it was 13%, so a little bit lower. Um, so it's a suggestive trial. I'll say that, um, again, this is, a, this is something that trauma surgeons are interested in. There's another trial going on asking this question as well, where they're giving higher ratios of, of plasma to some patients. So we'll see more data coming out about this as well. And as a reminder, when we went over the ASAP clinical guidelines for blunt trauma that we reviewed, the recommendation is one to one to one, two, one to one to one and a half uh, for ASAP, and that's blunt trauma. Um, all right, 101. Oh, one. Uh, which is better for DOAC reversal in trauma and an exonet or four factor PCC? I think if we like killed an exonet yet. Yeah, I think I, we've, we've talked about it. We've for talked sure. about it. Um, this one wanted to look and see, surgeons wanted to see specifically, I need to take this person emergently to surgery or they have a major trauma. Does this reverse uh, DOACs better? Uh, and they compared the to, but their primary outcome was units of blood that ended up needing to be given to the patient. And what they found was there was no difference. There's 24% of the patients given and next at alpha ended up needing blood transfusions. And 20% of the patients that were given uh, prothrombin complex needed to get blood transfusions. Uh, there was no difference in the things that we care about, like their mortality, ICU length of stay, um, whether they needed to be transferred or not transferred. Uh, so I really don't see any other evidence to support that adnex and at alpha is a better choice when you, uh, than four-factor PCC if yeah. you have it available. So another, another paper um, supporting the use of PCC and not the nails in the coffin for indexinet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Except when the specialist tells you that that's what they want you to give and you're stuck. Mm -hmm. um, all right, the last two papers here are about chest tubes. Um, number 102 is about small versus large bore uh, thoracostomies for traumatic hemothorax. So we're not talking about simple pneumothorax, we're talking about hemothorax and trauma. Can you go smaller bore? Um, and I think, the, we've, I think we've talked about this before that, that the answer is yes, that the, we're moving away from the garden hose in traumatic hemothorax to 
into a smaller bore chest tube seems to work as well. Now, what's the concern? Why, why would we even talk about it? The reason is because people worry about it draining, right? right. That you have clots, you've got this clotty blood in there, and shouldn't it have to be a large bore chest tube? It turns out that actually small bore would do a pretty good job. And that this is what this, uh, this paper looks at. This is a systematic review meta-analysis from Miami. They pulled out 11 studies, almost 2,000 subjects comparing smaller bore to large bore chest tubes for traumatic hemothorax. When they say small bore, what am I talking about? I'm talking about 14 French or less versus large being 20 or more. Um, in these 11 studies, there were three RCTs, five chart reviews, three others. They still did a meta-analysis despite, despite the fact that we've said you really shouldn't do that when you have these heterogeneous types of studies, but they did it anyway. Uh, no one's stopping them. So the failure rate, failure rate was basically same, same. So saying that smaller tube is just as good as larger tube, so why wouldn't you go smaller tube? It's less painful, not as not as invasive. Um, so, you know, unfortunately they did a meta-analysis when they shouldn't have done it, but I think the idea of going smaller bore has been borne out in other papers as well, and they looked at a lot of them, um, and it's a good way to go. So you don't have to go with the garden hose. I will say that we've removed all of our really big chest tubes from our trauma area, um, and we're uh, going for the smaller bore. Now, when I say smaller bore, I'm not, not ta talking about pigtails. I'm talking just about smaller than the big old ones. So, yeah. They're so giant. I got reamed out once by a trauma surgeon because I had a traumatic hemonumo. Young guy who was playing hockey got checked and ended up with a traumatic hemonumo. And I put in a small bore chest tube because I, I was like, ah, oh, you don't really need a big one. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and he was like, ah you need to put a big one. This was also probably like 15 years ago and yeah. I still, I, I'm still a little bit burned by it, but I'll do the right thing for the patient. And I think that this shows that you can offer a smaller one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. The last one is, uh, does irrigation reduce complications when placing chest tubes? Is anyone doing irrigation after you put in a chest tube for a hemothorax? No. Yeah. So it looks like here in two centers, they do it and they think that it improves things. So there, it was five years of data, 11 trauma centers, and there were 500 chest tubes that were placed. Um, and they, want, they irrigated the cavity with one liter of warm normal saline after they put the chest tube in. And they wanted to see if, in some of the sites, and then they wanted to see if they ended up having less uh, complications. And the complications included getting an empyema or, uh, you know, any better. Uh, bad outcomes as a result of, of, of having that chest tube in. And so what they found was that there was 20, that the um, saline irrigation uh, was done mostly at two of the centers uh, and the rest of the centers weren't really doing it, but they had a lower rate of complication. So 8% versus 13% when you did the irrigation uh, at the time of tube placement. So you put the tube in, you put in the warm saline, and then that reduced their complications that they ended up having afterwards. I don't know that this is necessarily generalizable or that this is information that I can go and put out into practice. I think I'd love to see a true randomized clinical trial that shows that this is something better to do for patients. Um, but just so you know the numbers that are available, it seemed like when they did do it, there was a decrease in um, complications as a result of having the chest tubes in. One of the complications that we don't see after patients leave the emergency department with hemothorax is the empyema mm -hmm. complication if it's not fully drained, but also that they have to go for a vaccine procedure right. or have sort of a subsequent procedure. So the idea of this irrigation is that if you're not completely draining the blood, that the saline will get in there and kind of, you know, get the rest of it. Yeah, get the rest of it out. And it's not that hard to do. Um, that being said, I, I think the answer probably is that this is this might be good for some patients, probably not for all patients, right. right? So if you put your chest tube in, you do a repeat chest X-ray, and you're pretty drained, I don't think you need to be doing this. But for those patients where there's still a significant amount of blood, first of all, you have to make sure your chest tube is pro you know right. properly placed, and that you have to kind of troubleshoot the chest tube in the, in the first place. But this may be a solution to that problem in terms of like diluting the blood that's in there and helping it drain out so there's not residual. Does it does it mean you have to do it in the emergency department? Not necessarily. This is also something that could be done up in the SICU. So, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be done by you. But I agree, we're not doing this at my place. Um, right. We're not doing this irrigation thing. Uh, but it's not that hard to do. It could be that if you work in a place where you're going to transfer somebody and you haven't completely drained it, you, maybe you have a trauma surgeon on the other end asking you to do this. It's not a crazy thing to ask you to do. It's I don't know that you need to change your 
practice right now. But right. if you're looking at people that you hold for a long time that have this residual blood, this is one thing that trauma surgery is talking about, about something you could do at the bedside to get that blood out more successfully. Awesome. All right. Let's go ahead and review. Review. So whole blood, very hot topic. Trauma surgery loves to talk about it. We don't have the best evidence yet. This um, paper number 98 uh, also it tells us that survival seems to favor whole blood, but it's not a methodologically sound paper yet. We need RCT data. It's going to come. Uh, does the timing of whole blood transfusion matter in trauma? In this study, if you were given whole blood, being given it earlier seemed to improve mortality, but we really need a randomized control trial. Um, number 100 was about maybe we need to raise the ratio of FFP to RBCs when we're talking about massive transfusion for some people. This was an interesting paper coming out of Japan looking at a database saying that there may be an association with a mortality benefit. It will also lead to an RCT looking at this again. Which is better for DOAC reversal and trauma and Nexnet or four-factor PCC? Four-factor yeah. PCC is just fine. Small bore tubes in traumatic hemothorax, more humane, just as good as the large bore for traumatic hemothorax. Most people haven't completely shifted their care yet, so if you're not doing that, that's okay. It's a good conversation starter with a trauma surgeon. Does irrigation reduce complications when placing chest tubes? Maybe uh, decreasing some empyema or recurrent effusion requiring reintervention. It's not unreasonable if somebody asks you to do it.